Good morning and welcome to the Union Church of Manila Sunday online worship service. Union Church of Manila, UCM, is a church of many nations committed to making disciples who are transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am Pastor Noah Kennedy and I am glad that you are able to join our live stream service today. We do hope that this time of worship and reflection will encourage you in your walk with the Lord. We also want to take this chance to invite you to join us in person, which offers much more interaction with godly people as well as a festive atmosphere in the majestic UCM sanctuary. Each week we welcome new people from different corners of the globe and would love to welcome you too. Our service will begin in a few minutes as we are preparing the in-person venue. In the meantime, we will be taking you through some important announcements and different ways that you can become involved in Union Church of Manila. Again, we welcome you to UCM. Welcome to Union Church of Manila. I am Ariel and I serve in the UCM Chancel Choir. Before the service begins, allow me to share with you some important reminders. We invite children from two years old to grade six to Kingdom Kids Sunday School. Please register at the Basement 2 foyer. For inquiries, email children at unionchurch.ph. Calling students in grades seven to 12. Join the Youth Sunday Service at 10.30 at the Youth Room. You're also encouraged to register for the Youth Camp to be held in Lukban, Quezon. Today is the last day to sign up. Just scan the QR code or email youth at unionchurch.ph. Let's give some of our time for others. Mark your calendars and join us to feed our streets. Please visit the Missions and Benevolence table in the Fellowship Hall for more information. Attention! Men of all ages, come out of your man cave and be encouraged by God's word. Plus, enjoy fellowship with other guys over coffee and quality breakfast together. Kingdom Men Fellowship happens every first Saturday of the month. Join the Kingdom Men Fellowship for the first time, anytime. Our giving blesses those in need and provides others an opportunity to know Christ. Information about how to pledge and make an offering are provided in your bulletin and on the website. If you're worshiping online, we invite you to come and join our vibrant community here at Union Church. 
we have three Sunday services. We hope to see you soon. To all the dads, happy Father's Day. Thank you, and God bless everyone. Good morning, UCM. We are thrilled that you're with us today. Before we begin our worship, allow me to invite you to connect with us so we know how to serve you better. If you're new to Union Church, please grab the welcome card found in the pews and fill it out with information about yourself. You may just drop the card in the offering box or give it to one of the ushers. One more thing, we encourage you to visit the Welcome Center after the service. While you're there, you can meet several of our church leaders and members of our community, and they'll be happy to receive the welcome card there. Now, let's begin our time of worship together. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this time of worship and celebration at Union Church in Manila. And if you are here for the first time or visiting, uh, passing through, you're here for a season or just a, just a weekend, we love that you are here. And just to reiterate what Bea said on the video, please stick around and be with us after the worship service for refreshments. And it's a very warm and welcoming, loving community. We'd love to connect with you, get you plugged in to the church, and help you in any way that we might be able to help you. Uh, today is a set-apart day. Of course, it's Sunday. It's a day of worship and celebration, uh, as is every week. But it's a set-apart day in another way. I wonder if you can guess why it's set-apart today. It's Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, everyone. Happy Father's Day to all the dads. Uh, we are going to kick off our time of worship with a, a, a prayer on this Father's Day. So I invite you, if you'd like, maybe rather than uh, heads bowed, eyes closed, maybe heads up, eyes open or closed. And if you would like to just extend a hand as an expression of worship and thanksgiving to the Heavenly Father. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Father's Day. We thank you for all fathers and their roles in giving us life. We thank you for the fathers that chose us, and we thank you for the fathers that we have borrowed. May you bless all fathers and fathers-to-be everywhere. May you fill every father with your Holy Spirit and life so that they may love you and love others with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. We celebrate with those who have had good relationships with their fathers, and we pray that you would be the God of all comfort for the hurt. May you work your power of reconciliation, healing, and grace in every one of these relationships. Bless the memory of our fathers. We also lift up all men who desire to be fathers, dads. We pray that if it is your will, you would give them the desires of their heart. We pray for your blessing and abundant hope, joy, peace, and love to flow freely on them and all today. In your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. We have a gift for the dads, for the fathers on the way. Uh, I believe the ushers have them. They'll be passing those on the way out from the sanctuary today. Let's now call ourselves to worship, church. Let's call ourselves to worship. Let us gather together in unity to exalt the Lord. He is the light of the world. He is worthy to be praised. And now as the church, the congregation assembled here, let's respond to the call to worship. 
We gather as the church to lift our hearts and our voices to exalt the Lord. He alone is worthy to be praised. And as we stand, I see many already standing, excited to worship God today. That is wonderful. Let us just prepare our hearts, our common thought to really be directed unto God in worship this morning. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> and there's one Father in heaven with us who deserves all the praise.
all our worries, all our sadness, everything that's holding back to you. Thank you, Lord.
In alignment with our UCM value, United in Christ, we will be selecting prayers and liturgies from the last 2,000 years that have originated from a variety of Christian traditions around the world. Let us pray responsively. Psalm chapter 19, verses 7 to 10. The law of the Lord, the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Together, more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty, gracious Father, since our whole salvation depends on our true understanding of your holy word, grant us all that our hearts, freed from worldly affairs, may hear and understand your holy word with all diligence and faith, so that we may rightly discern your gracious will, cherish it, and live by it with all earnestness to your praise and honor through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us all stand and pray together the prayer Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us remain standing and affirm our faith by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's all remain standing and continue our worship.
worship, turn to a couple people around you, make some eye contact, greet one another, pass the peace. Well, good morning, and I want to add my uh, happy Father's Day words to those that have already been shared. We thank the Lord for uh, the fathers here that are uh, uh, here on a Sunday morning and a, a day where uh, you could be anywhere as a father doing anything, and uh, you have chosen to bring your family to this place, and uh, that is indeed the, uh, the marks of uh, a father who is a righteous father who is trying to bring their families in and equip them in the, in the things and the ways of the Lord. So we thank the Lord for you. Uh, this, this morning, we are not doing a, uh, typically, uh, as we often do here, as a Father's Day message. We're going to continue on in our study in First Peter. Uh, we have much to study and much to uh, put in in a, in a very limited amount of time, and so we're forging ahead. So if you have a Bible, I would encourage you to open that up to First uh, Peter chapter 1, and we will be looking at several verses today. We're starting a new section in Peter that is dealing with holiness. We're calling the series 100% Pure, uh, and uh, this week we're talking about being called to be a holy people. So let's uh, dive into the word and, and, and try and understand, dissect that and, and see what that really is all about. What does it mean to be a holy people? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day and we would pray that you would illuminate each person here with your word, that you would be glorified through it and we ask this in your name, amen. Well, I uh, spent a bit of time this week in the uh, obituary section in the New York Times. Say, wow, pastor, get a life, you know? Uh, what, <laughs> no pun intended, I guess, right? Get a life. Um, well, that came out of, as most of you know, a former pastor at Union Church of Manila. His name is Alex Arones. He's a very beloved uh, pastor at this church from years ago who helped build this building. And uh, he passed away a couple of weeks ago. And so I was reading online many of the comments that people were leaving regarding his life and the things that he had done and what he meant to them. And so that just sort of compelled me to think, well, there were other people in this world who passed away uh, at this time. I wonder how they're remembered. And so I, I went to what I know, uh, a place where I could find uh, memories and sort of uh, obituaries of people's lives. And I spent about 30 minutes just reading through the obituaries in the New York Times this last week. Let me, let me read you some of the things that are mentioned. Joyce passed away a couple weeks ago at the age of 94. She was an adoring wife, a loving daughter, devoted mother, cherished grandmother, great-grandmother. She was an avid golfer, great card player, Longtime member of the Sea Ware Club, Sea Wayne Club, and High Ridge Country Club. She was elegant, beautiful, enjoyed life to the fullest. Then there was Michael. He just wanted a seven word summary for his life. Michael loved Barbara. That says it all. Then there is Harold. He was a scientist with the soul of a poet. It was important that in his, by our, uh, uh, um, the memory of him, his eulogy that he was he, that he was remembered for having earned a PhD in metal metallurgy at Yale University. I didn't know what metallurgy is, so I had to look that up. It's the study of metals. How fascinating is that? <laughs> but he has a PhD in it, and that's what he was known for. Freddie, he was in the Eastern Tennis Hall of Fame. He died at 101, and he realized his American dream in 1989 when he purchased a 40-acre ranch in Wyoming and became a cattle rancher. Then there's Rose. She was just simply known as a passionate supporter of reproductive rights. Francois, an artist of exceptional erudition and wit, deeply committed to problems and poetry of image making. And the list goes on. And, and I kept reading for 
uh, roughly 30 minutes. I was reading the different short summaries that are given in the obituary section. And, and it was interesting as how people wanted their lives to be remembered. And how other people reflected on the lives of their loved ones. And, and as I kept reading, and as I kept reading, I, 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 you know, I was just getting more and more curious as to when somebody was going to mention the Lord. <laughs> when somebody was going to mention, hey, they were interested in Jesus, or they loved God, or something like that. But as I spent my entire 30 minutes going through that, no one mentioned those things. And certainly, no one mentioned the fact that they wanted to be known as being holy. You know, Rose, she longed for holiness. Ralph, he, he wanted holiness more than anything. His, mar, his life was marked by holiness, striving for holiness. Made me aware, I, I suppose, that holiness is not too much of a high priority in the 20th 21st century church and it's certainly something that is not considered outside of the church and and, and for some it even conjures up ideas of uh, you know antiquated puritanical sort of behavior and you know oh that's so 19th century so 1800 so 1700 we've come to a much more sophisticated faith than to talk about all you know, these things of you need to be holy <laughs> It has a lot of different connotations in different people's mind. But that is certainly not the case for the Apostle Peter, who spends a great deal of his letter to the churches in exile in Asia Minor, talking about this idea, this concept of holiness. In fact, in chapter 1, he reminds the believers how they should conduct themselves while in exile. If you've been with us in our series, you know that we have been talking about life in exile and life in suffering. And we talked about how to have the right outlook and, and joy and how to have comfort in exile. But now Peter is moving to this concept where he says, now let's talk about your conduct in exile. As you go through suffering, as you live in exile, let's talk about how you ought to live your life. And this theme of holiness comes up. Let's take a look at verses 13 through 17. He says this. He says, therefore, preparing your mind. By the way, that therefore, we're going to come back to that next week. All right? With this same set of texts is going to be used again next week. All right? So I'm going to be a little bit redundant. I'm going to give you the big picture on holiness today. And then we're going to come back next week and, and break it down much more, uh, you know, microscopically. All right? So therefore, we're going to take a whole section on that therefore next week. But he says, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who, is who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Circle that word, in all your conduct. It says, be holy. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. That comes from Leviticus. We'll, we'll, we'll look at that today. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deed, here it is again, conduct, circle that, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. So here he is, as these believers are beginning to navigate life in exile, as uh, followers of Jesus Christ, and in their suffering, Peter reminds them of their conduct. And, and specifically, over the next 25 verses, he is going to talk about holiness. Here he says, be holy. And then if you look in a couple of verses later, he says, you are a holy priesthood. And, and then a few verses later after that, he says, you are a holy nation. He is talking about what it means to be a holy people. And, and what he's saying, I think, is that while you are in exile, don't forget how to live. Don't forget who you are, that you are citizens of another nature, nation, that you are people that are, don't belong to the world around you. And, and you are residing in an unholy place, but you are called to something different. You are set apart for holiness. Don't forget your heritage. I'm reminded of, in the, in the Old Testament scriptures, I'm sure many of you are aware of the book called Esther. 
Now, Esther is the story of the Jewish people in Babylonian exile. Remember, we've been talking about exile. We've been talking about captivity. And and the people of Jerusalem were taken out of Jerusalem and they were taken to Babylon. Remember that? That's what this is all about, exile. We've been talking about this all along. And they sat on the banks of the river uh, and they wept remembering their, the songs of uh, 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 remembering Jerusalem. And so here they are. They, they, these people are the people that are in exile. That's what the book of Esther is about. Now, in the middle of all that, there are two little books in the Bible. One is called Ezra and the other one's called Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah are the story of the return back to Jerusalem. That they were allowed to go back to Jerusalem at the end of the exile. That several groups of people were allowed to return. Now now think about that. They could go back to Jerusalem and practice the faith that they had always practiced. The way they wanted to practice it. They could live out the law of God without reservation. They could sing their songs openly. They weren't forced to honor the Babylonian deities. And they could go back. And so many people were excited to go back. Exile is over. We can go back and act like the people of God that we are. But the story of Esther is different. The story of Esther is the story of those people who didn't want to go back. (laughs) They liked Babylon. They were happy in Babylon. They they wanted to be there. They had the chance to go back with uh, uh, Nehemiah and and they had the chance to go back with, with Ezra. But they were comfortable in exile. There's a lot of good luxuries in Babylon. That's a beaming metropolis. And after all, Jerusalem's been abandoned for seven years. What's there to do there? It's a little nothing of a town. Let's stay in exile. Let's stay in Jerusalem. And and, and there was arts, there's entertainment. There there are amenities. There were things that you couldn't do in Jerusalem. Ah, you know what? Those deities, they're not so bad. If you just ignore them, just kind of work around them, you know. The moral practices, yeah, we see that. But, you know, we can, we can, we're okay with that. And so they were content sort of conforming to exile instead of going back and being the selected people of God that God wanted them to be. And, and so here we are when we come here. To to this text, I think what Peter is doing is, he says, I don't want you to lose your identity of your holy calling while you are in exile. That you need to keep the purity of your heavenly culture. You, You need to embrace that. Be holy in exile. And that begs the question. Now, if I were to ask people here, you know, what is holy? That's an interesting thing, right? I mean, I would come up with a a variety of different things. What does it mean to be holy? And and by the way, it's mentioned in some form or another over 600 times in scripture. Now, if it's mentioned that many times in scripture, we should uh, probably pay attention, right? And and it says, you know, know, this theme of holy, and then it says be holy. Well, we probably need to talk about what that means. For some of us, it's a list of do's and don'ts. If I do these seven things and I don't do these seven things, voila, (laughs) I'm holy, right? It might include things that we watch on TV. It might include the, the way that we dress. It, you know, some people have thought wearing long black skirts and, you know, without colors, we're holy, you know. Uh, it might be an appearance. Well, uh, years ago, I was uh, drinking a root beer in a bottle. <laughs> Looks like a beer bottle. And somebody came to me and said, oh, don't do that. I said, why? What, what is wrong with this? He said, oh, it has the appearance of unrighteousness. It, you, you know, there, you're not holy if you have a root beer. I'm like, whoa, whoa, what this is. But that was his concept of, of unrighteousness. You have the appearance of unholiness. For others, a holy means a vocation. It means, you know, if, if I want to be holy, I need to go to some sort of convent. I, I need to go to a monastery. I need to uh, may, maybe become a missionary. I need to take on a, a certain form of, 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 of vocation and live an extraordinary life that is, uh, you, you know, the saints and, uh, that we talk about sometimes in church history. But most people, when we talk about holiness, it's associated with this moral code. It's associated with moral purity or righteousness and perfection. And certainly that has something to do with it. But I think to help us better understand the idea of holiness, let's go back to the first time it's used in scripture. Don't you think that's a good place to start? 
And, and the first time holiness is mentioned is all the way back in Genesis chapter 2, in the very foundation of Scripture itself. If you look in Genesis chapter 2, drop your eyes down to verse 3. It's talking about the, the days of creation in chapter 1. And God made on the seventh day, what did he do? What did he make? Nothing. <laughs> what did he do? He rested, right? So look at what it says. It says, after he rested, after he's done making everything, he takes the seventh day and he rests for himself. And he says, the scripture says, so God blessed the seventh day and he made it holy. It's an interesting thing. How could a day be holy? I mean, think about it. I mean, was, you, you know, all the other six days where they had, you know, sinful things going on, you know, on the sixth day. And all of a sudden, the seventh day is morally perfect. You know, Bibles are falling from heaven and no root beer on the seventh day, right? And those types of things. What, what made the six days not holy? And then all of a sudden he says, oh, the seventh day, why, why that one's holy, that one's set apart, you know, no weeds grew on that day. You know, what, what was it? You know, the dirt is better. I don't know. What, what makes it the, the seventh day holy? Well, if you look at the word here, when it talks about this idea of holy, the, the Hebrew word really is this idea of being set apart. That, that's what it means to be set apart. It means that the seventh day was set apart Unto God for God's exclusive use, for his glory, for his purpose, a day made for himself, exclusively for himself. He made the six days and the seventh day he said, oh, that's the Sabbath. That one's for me. And so they set, he sets that day apart unto himself. But now let's go and look at the second time we see the word holy in the Bible. You have to go a whole chapter, a whole book of the Bible later and you go to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter three, verse five. Moses, if you remember the story, he comes across a bush that is burning in the wilderness and it's not consumed. And, and so he comes up to this bush and he, he, uh, as he's approaching it, there's a voice out of the bush. Now that always gets your attention when you're walking up and you hear a voice coming out of your, your, your plants, right? He says this, and the text says in Exodus 3, 5, he says, don't come near, take your sandals off your feet for the place in which you're standing is holy ground. Now, how does the ground get holy? <laughs> Isn't that, I mean, come on. Is this dirt over here unholy, right? Is this over here, you know, they do all kinds of bad things on this dirt. But as soon as you come on to this dirt, again, you know, Bibles are growing up. Or, or what, what is happening in this area that makes this ground, it's the same dirt, isn't it? I mean, do, do, do the type of dirt change? Does it go from brown dirt to white dirt? You know, fine sand, grainy sand? What, what, what does it do? What, why is this ground in particular holy? Well, the, again, the idea here is that that ground is set apart for the Lord. He's saying that that ground is no longer ordinary. It is set apart for his use. It is a place that is special to God, not only in proximity to God, but also for the use of God. And so there it is different than all other ground for the purpose that is set apart for God himself. See, it's not just dirt. You can go throughout the book of Leviticus and there's all kinds of things that are holy. If you look at the temple, there, there's a picture here of the temple. Here's a sort of a, a rough picture of the temple. You have the outer courtyard, the holy place, and the holy of holies. And in the holy of holies is the Ark of the Covenant. But in these other areas, there's, there's it's called the author, uh, altar of burnt offering. And what that is, is just a giant grill, you know, like a barbecue grill. <laughs> and they would put animals on it. It's just it's just, it's pretty ordinary, actually. It's not all that impressive. And then you've got a, a laver, which is a, a place, it's just a wash bin, you know? It would be like our, our baptismal font, and you would wash yourself as you went into it. It's just a sink, a glorified sink, right? And then you go in, and you got a menorah. And what a menorah is, it's just candles. It's just more or less lighted uh, oil lit uh, uh, candles that light up the temple area. And then you've got a table and, and then you've got another altar. It's another table that's there. And they're really quite ordinary things. But the Bible tells us that all of those things in the temple are what? Holy. Why? It's just a piece of furniture. How does furniture become holy? 
Furniture becomes holy when it is set apart exclusively for the purposes of God and for God's glory. All of those were used to worship God and bring glory to God, and they were taken out and set apart for his glory. Now, dozens of times we can go throughout the scripture. We have the tithe is holy. It's money. Money is holy. Certain elements, you know, part of the money that that was given in the Old Testament, not holy. But then there's a part of it, oh, this money over here now is holy. Why? It is set apart unto God for his purpose, for his glory. Then you had days of the year that were considered holy days, set apart unto the Lord. There was land that was holy. There was sacrifices. There were even pots, pots that were normal, and then all of a sudden they become holy. It's like this. I, I, I set this up. You're wondering what all this is about, right? I got all the coffee cups out of my, my, my office this morning. I asked them to bring them down, okay? So imagine, these are all the utensils, right? They're, they're just common cups, there's no cup here that you go, oh, wow, that one's, that one's spectacular. It's made so extraordinary. But it becomes, in the Old Testament system, if I were to take any random cup, let's just take this one here. It's, yeah, I don't even know what's on it. So I take this out. If I'm the Lord, I say, out of all of these cups, I'm going to take this one and I'm going to set it apart for me and my glory. It is different than all of these cups. And now I am using it exclusively for me. It is set apart. These are ordinary. These are average. But this has been set apart. This cup is now holy. You get that? That that makes sense? That's the Old Testament concept. So when you had normal, all this dirt is normal dirt. But then when there's a dirt that's set apart for me and my glory, now that's holy dirt. All of this money over here, this is ordinary money. But now we take this money and we set it apart. It's exclusively for me and my glory and my fame. Now it's holy money. Everything in the Old Testament is that way. There there are things that are set apart unto God to uh, bring him glory. And you say, well, Pastor Chad, well, doesn't the Bible say that God is holy? What about that? What is he doing? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up this morning (laughs) in your mind. I know what you're thinking. What does that mean? It means here, that you know, in the Old Testament, over and over again, it says, the Lord is holy, the Lord is holy, time and time again. Hey, you've got Isaiah chapter 6, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And then, you, you, you know, you have uh, uh, Exodus uh, 15, 3. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, in majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, d- in doing wonders? Now, what does that mean? When God is holy, he is separated from everything else. He is separated to himself for his glory. He is unlike anything else. He is uniquely set apart for his own fame, his own majesty, his own wonder, and there is nothing that rivals him. In fact, if you look at this verse, what does it say? Who is like you among what? Oh, there's all these other gods, right? They're common, they're idols, they're they're ordinary. But I am set apart, unlike any other. There is no one like me. He is holy. He is separated unto himself for his own glory. Now, think about all this. Now, in the scripture, we have, you know, days can be holy. Utensils can be holy. Dirt can be holy. Pots can be holy. Money can be holy. What do we call this? The Holy Bible books can be holy. By the way, what is this? I mean, there's a lot of books, right? There's all the books in the world, (laughs) This one is set apart unto me for my glory and my fame. We call it the holy book, right? Because it's set apart unto him. Now, so all of these things are set apart. Now, look at the text. Go here. Now, when Peter, er, what the Lord says here in in Exodus chapter 9. So we have all these other things that are considered holy. But then God sort of turns this title uniquely to something else. Notice what he says. Exodus chapter 19, verse 5. He says, now, therefore... If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possessions among all peoples. For all the earth is mine. And you shall be a kingdom of priests and... What? Holy nation. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the people of Israel. And what does he say? Oh, I'm going to set you apart. Of all the peoples in the earth, of everybody, of all the nations that exist on the planet, I am taking you out of the ordinary, 
And I am setting you apart exclusively for my glory and for my fame. To bring glory to me. Your exclusive purpose is all about bringing my name to the nations of the earth. And then if you go into just a a couple of uh, books later, it says in Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 6, it says, For you are a holy people. And notice, he says, he has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possessions out of all the nations in the face of the earth. Notice this. Now, now this is amazing right here. Here's the people of Israel right here in all of the nations of the earth. And the Lord's looking over. Ah, yes, you. I'm setting you apart. You have a specific purpose for my glory. You are set apart exclusively unto me for my fame, and my goodness. Now, let's fast forward when we start thinking about all the things that are in the Levitical law. Since you've moved from a common cup to a special cup, as the people of Israel have, the Lord is constantly in the Old Testament telling them, be holy. Over and over again, if you read the book of Leviticus, you'll see, be holy, for I am holy. Be holy, for I am holy. He's reminding them in every category of their life that they are called to be holy. So he gives them food regulations. Okay, what you can eat. Certain things you can't eat, certain things you can't eat. You go, what does that have to do with holiness? I'll get there in a minute. He, he gives them regulations on bodily regulations. Certain things you do to your body, certain things you don't do to your body. He gives them uh, cleanliness regulations. Like if there's mold on the wall, get rid of that. <laughs> It's no good. It's unclean. And then he gives farming regulations and and don't mix crops. He gives clothing regulations. You don't mix silk and and cotton. He gives them work regulations and worship regulations. Why does he do that? And then after he says all of those regulations, he sets those apart and he says, now be holy, right? Okay, let me just give you an example because some of you got a blank look here. So if we go to Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44, He is given eating regulations, all right? And he says, you you know, when it comes to swarming bugs, don't eat those, okay? Does anybody have a, you know, big appetite for swarming bugs, you know? I mean, if you do, then tune out here for a minute. You're Gentiles, you can eat whatever you'd like. But he says, don't eat the bugs. Don't eat the swarming bugs. And then he says, for I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourself and be holy for I am holy. What on earth does eating bugs have to do with holiness, being set apart? It it really, it doesn't have anything to do with the bugs in itself. It is the idea that God wants in every category of our lives to be thinking about holiness. When you went to the dinner table, think about what you eat because you're a separated people, you're holy. And then when you put your clothes on in the morning, oh, think about how you're dressing, that you're not common from the rest of the world. You are a separated people. And then by the way, when you're cleaning your house, oh, think about this. You're a holy people. You're separated. You're chosen people. You're a special people. And then by the way, when you're going out to farm and when you farm this way, don't mix your crops. Why? Because it's the reminder that you are a holy people and I'm a holy God. And then when you go to worship, remember these things, that you are a holy people. Every category of their lives, he is reminding them, you're holy, you're separated. You're you're a different people than all the nations. I selected you out of the nation of the world. I want to embed this so deeply in your mindset so that every moment of every day, you remember that you are separated unto me for my purposes. That's a pretty bold thing to do, isn't it? Uh, it, It's remarkable. Every category of life, from morning to dusk, to dawn, or morning till, uh, till evening. Be holy, for I am holy. Now, Let's fast forward to Peter. Peter says that this doesn't only apply to Israel now. Notice what he says in verse 15. He says, be holy as I am holy. Chapter two, verse five, he uses the same language. You Christians in Asia Minor are a holy priesthood. And then in 2.9, he says, you are a holy nation. Believers in Asia Minor. Out of all the people in all the world, God selected you. He saw you and he said, you are the ones. I have elected you. I have given you my salvation. I have chosen you. Those are some of the words we used in the first weeks of First Peter. Remember those words? Elected, chosen. I have chosen you. 
to be set apart for my purposes and my glory. And that reminds us as people of God what we are chosen for. We are set apart for the task as believers to the unrivaled glory of God. When he gave you his salvation, when he chose you for that salvation, he said, now you're different. You're set apart for me. Every part of you for me, right? By, by the cup, we don't go, well, this part's for God and this part's for me and this part. No, the whole thing is set apart as a utensil unto God himself. I put number one, jot it down if you're following along. I need to remember that God has set me apart for himself. He set me apart for himself. When he called you, he, he set us apart for his purposes and his glory and his use. And by the way, this is where holiness begins. It doesn't start with the list. Okay, I've got to do this, 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 and this, and now I'm holy. And, and if I don't do this, 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 and this, and now I'm holy. No, it starts by saying, no, he selected me to be set apart for his glory. And once you get that in your mind, then everything else falls into place of how we live our lives, right? So parenthetically, by the way, when, when we think about this, this highlights the subthought here. And the subthought is this. Let's not forget that our holiness is not for you alone. Your holiness and striving for holiness is not just to make you feel better. Do you understand that? You know what that is? You know, if, I'm just, if I could just be more like Jesus, I would feel so much better about myself. I wouldn't have so much guilt in my life. I, I just want to be better and better and better. It, listen, that's not what it is. It's not so that I can look in the mirror and say, I'm such a good person. I'm a holy person. Woohoo! look at me. And then sort of look down at everybody else. <laughs> not holy, not holy, not holy. <laughs> look at me. That's not what your holiness is about. What is it about? It is about to bring him glory. He set you apart, not so that you could look in the mirror and go, wow, and feel good about it. Here's the thing. This is what we do. We sort of treat holiness in the books that I have, many of them, not all of them, but I've read so many books and they're sort of like, when it comes to holiness, many of them are like self-help books on dieting, right? And, and good health, right? If you do these things, you'll lose 10 pounds and you'll feel so much better about yourself. Step one, step two, step three, step four, and boom, now you have got a fit body and you're ready to go. And oftentimes we read the books on holiness and it's very similar. If you do this, 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 you are a fit Christian and you're ready to go. And they never mention the fact that, wait, it doesn't even start there. It doesn't start with you getting yourself fixed. It starts with God has set you apart unto himself, that your holiness is not for you, your holiness, and you are set apart for him and his glory. And that is our starting point that we need to know in this next five weeks when we're talking about holiness, we need to know that is the starting point. It is for him and his glory alone. In fact, if you look at uh, uh, 2 Peter, or 1 Peter chapter 2, look at, look at what it says. It says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people chosen for his possession. Read this aloud with me. That you may proclaim the excellencies of of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Why are you holy? You are a holy people so you can look in the mirror and go, whoa, look at me, holy. Does it say that? No, he says, I chose you out of all the nations of the earth. I chose you out of all the people of the earth. I made you my possession for my excellency <laughs> that I might be seen as somebody who is indeed excellent. See, I put number two, jot this one down. I need to remember my holiness is more about God's glory than my goodness. It's more about God's glory than my goodness. And if such is the case, beloved, this means that every category in our lives needs to be reoriented unto him. Every part of our life is given to him. Like the instrument of the tabernacle, we are uniquely to be used in everything we do for him. Remember, they took that instrument and they put it in the tabernacle and that was exclusively for the work of the Lord in the tabernacle. You take this cup and you set it apart. There is not one part of this cup that we say, okay, this part is all for the Lord and this part's not for the Lord. But he says, no, I have chosen you. I've given you your salvation. I've set you apart into the tabernacle out of the common things. You you were in the common things, now you're in the extraordinary things. And I have set you apart. All of you now is for me. 
You are uniquely mine. You know, that indeed is what holiness is. It's, it's what Paul says here in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Read it with me aloud if you would. It says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord. You know what that is? You know what Paul is giving us here? Holiness 101. <laughs> Everything you do, we do it for the Lord. You're uniquely set apart unto the Lord for his purpose. That means, that means as I'm raising my children, I want to be holy. So I, I raise them for the Lord. As I go to my work, as, as I do my job, I'm displaying his excellency. As I'm living my life, I, I want to show his glory. As I'm working on my marriage, I, I'm doing it for his fame. Everything that I do is I use my body and the way that I use it and the morality that I choose, I do it for his beauty. My life is now set apart every category for him unto himself. Like the people of Israel, God wants us to remember that every category of our life is given to him and his glory and his fame. There's an, an interesting text in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter five. Many of you know it. Uh, has to do with marriage. Paul, by the way, in the New Testament, Paul loves the analogy of the church as in a sort of a marital relationship with Christ, right? Christ being the bridegroom and the church being the bride. It, that analogy is used all throughout the, the writings of Paul. But in uh, chapter five of Ephesians, he, he adds one element that I think is very helpful here. Notice what he says. He's talking about this relationship. He's talking about the bride-groom relationship. And then he talks about in relationship to the church. And he says this. He says that Christ might present the church to himself as the bridegroom in splendor. That the bridegroom will, will bring the church to himself in splendor. And then he says without spot or wrinkle, any such thing, that she might be holy. Without blemish. What is he saying? Christ the groom is going to separate the church unto himself for him alone. He says, at the moment of salvation, he takes them out and he says, Now you are mine. And as you are mine, you reorient everything in your life for that calling that you have been married to me. I, I, let, me let me put it this way. My, my, when I do a lot of weddings around here and there's a line in my wedding ceremony that I always use. I make the couple repeat it. There's a couple here this morning. We'll be marrying very quickly next month. They will have to repeat this line. Heads up, guys. <laughs> it says, I give you loyal love, everything I am and everything I have. That's the marriage relationship. What happens? That means at that moment, the bride reorients everything in her life based upon the bridegroom. Everything now goes over to the bridegroom. She, she is for him exclusively. She is even separated from her parents exclusively for him. Everything is reoriented. She is his ex exclusive treasured possession. I think of, you know, what my wife gave me when we got married. She didn't give me a lot of money. I thought I was marrying into money. You know, it didn't work out unless she's hiding it somewhere. I'm not sure. I didn't get much. I got a broken down kind of old car that broke down in a year. You know, I didn't get any of those types of things. But that was all right. You want to know why? Because she gave me everything she had and everything she was. Out of the 8 billion people, 4 billion men on the earth, she said, hmm, I am out of all of these, I have a choice. I am separating myself and I'm giving you all I am and all I have. She was holy mine, W-H-O-L-L-Y. And she was holy mine, H-O-L-Y. She was separated unto me. I'm happy she was. <laughs> She's mine. It, and that's what Paul, I think, is trying to say that Christ does as the bridegroom. He says to the church, I gave you salvation. I, I, I married you. I wed you. And now I separate it. Now you, out of all the people of the earth, now you separate yourself unto me, wholly over to me. 
that is the root of our faith. That is what the uh, holiness is all about, where we need to reorient our lives unto him. I put number three, jot it down. A desire for holiness should cause me to reorient every category of my life. Every category of my life reoriented to him. So listen, over the next five weeks, I'm gonna be talking a lot about holiness. I'm gonna be talking about different categories of our lives that need to be reoriented unto him. But it starts here, right? Where I say, everything I am and everything I have is yours. That's holiness. That is the root, that is the beginning, that is the foundation of all holiness in our lives. We start with that understanding that we have been separated unto God. I used to sing a song back in the 1990s. Maybe some of you know it. Remember the song? It said, holiness is what I long for. Holiness is what I need. Holiness is what you want from me. It was a big popular song. And I I was a young man early in ministry. And I always used to think about that like, oh yeah, I just want to stop sinning so I don't feel bad about myself. That's what I want. That's what I need. That's not what that holiness is about. (laughs) Holiness is about, Lord, I just want to be given wholly over to you and reorient my whole life unto you for your purposes and for your goodness because you have chosen me out of the people of the earth as a selected instrument for you. So that's what I long for and that's what I need in my life. And let me ask you, is that something that you desire to be that utensil in the temple of God? What what is it going to be on your epitaph? You know, what what is the story of your life? I want them to say, well, Chad... He wanted to be holy. He wanted to be set apart unto the Lord. Similar to David Brainerd, 1700. I love this guy. He was known for his holiness. After he died, well, he had written a journal and uh, Jonathan Edwards read his journal after he died and he published it because uh, of what he wrote in it. But listen to what David Brainerd wrote in one page of his diary. He said, oh, I feel it's heaven to please him and to be just what he would have me to be. Oh, that my soul were holy as he is holy. Oh, that it were pure, even as Christ is pure, as my Father in heaven is perfect. These, I feel, are the sweetest commands in God's book, comprising all others. Oh, that I could concentrate myself, soul and body, for his service forever. Oh, that I could give myself to him so as never more to attempt to be my own. That's somebody whose holiness is what I long for. Holiness is what I need. Do we have that sort of prayer in our lives for holiness? One quick story and we'll finish here. When I was a kid growing up, uh, we had um, special dishes. I don't know if you have special dishes in your house. (laughs) Special uh, silverware, special plates, special bowls. And, And these special dishes, they were the nice ones and they were stepped away from the regular dishes. In fact, they're in an entirely different room, in an entirely different cabinet. And, uh, you know, they were shiny in every way and they were perfect in every way. And um, you, we used them for only special occasions. You know, we had ordinary dishes over here and for ordinary things, we would use those uh, ordinary dishes. But the special dishes, you know, some of them had gold-plated silverware and uh, well, goldware, I guess, and, uh, you, you know, just perfect plates. And, and now, if, if I were to go into that hutch or that cabinet on a Monday evening after school and walk in and grab out one of those plates and throw a hot dog on it and put some ketchup on it and throw it in the microwave, I might not be standing here today. <laughs> my, my mother is here, and she, would, she might not have let me live past... The next day, if she saw me taking out those plates and that, those dishes out of that cabinet and putting a hot dog on it with ketchup. I don't think those dishes ever saw ketchup, nor a hot dog. I think that was the forbidden food on those plates. Those were meant for roast beef. <laughs> those were meant for ham. Those were meant for turkey. You, you know the kind of stuff that you cook all day. 
Those came out just a couple days of the year. And when very special people would come over, then we would pull out those. But, you know, if I'm waking up on a Monday morning and I'm having cereal, I go into the, ca- the cabinet and I get the plastic bowls, right? And I get the plates that have little chips on them and, and, and the forks that might have a little bend in them. I might get the, 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 the bowls that are, 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 are scratched or, or whatnot. You get the common plates for the common everyday items of life. But every now and then, when something really special would happen, what do we do? We'd go to the hutch. We'd pull out the special silverware and the special bowls. And I think that's what scripture is doing here. It's reminding us that you have been placed in a separate cabinet used for a special purpose of the excellencies of God. You are not common when he selected you. You are not ordinary when he chose you. You are not just average when he elected you. He selected you for his excellencies. And how, when we know that, this governs our morality, it governs our work, it governs our priorities, it governs our attitudes. We are holy. Say it, I am holy. Say, I am a special dish. <laughs> Indeed you are in a separate cabinet used for the excellencies of God. Oh, don't you want that as an epitaph of your life? He was holy. She was holy. She was separated unto God. And this is the word of the Lord for the separated people of God. Lord, thank you that you have called us and separated us for your excellencies and your glory and your goodness. I pray that over the next few weeks, we can start orienting our lives according to that sacred calling that you have given us and that sacred position that you have placed upon us. We thank you for the word of Peter that you have given to him that encourages us and challenges us. Here we are 2,000 years later. In your name, amen. So
amen, amen. Happy Father's Day to all the dads. As you go, uh, do pick up just a simple gift that we have for you as you exit the sanctuary. And just so you know, men of the church, we have Kingdom Men Fellowship Breakfast on July 1. Uh, so stretch into holiness, not alone, but come be a part of, of doing, this, doing this life of holiness with other men of the church and brothers in Christ. Thank you. Let's uh, close in our liturgy together this morning. So as our gathering ends, so now our service begins and the congregation responds. Go then now, you are sent. Let us close with our final benediction. Now, excuse me, doxology. Now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory. Be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen, amen. God bless. Have a great week.